and welcome to Exploring with the Estuarium. My name is Ariel and I'll be your educator. Today we're going to learn all about food chains, what animals eat in the Puget Sound, and how humans impact the food web. During this lesson, you will get answers to questions such as, what is the difference between a food chain and a food web? How is energy transferred in the ecosystem? And why are estuary food webs so important? The Puget Sound is the second largest estuary in the nation. Fed by 10,000 streams and rivers, it is one of the most productive water bodies in North America. High productivity leads to high biomass and many food chains or complex food webs. What is a food chain? Food chains are how organisms are related to each other by the food they eat. Food chains show what eats what in one direction, or up the trophic level. Food webs connect many chains and can go multiple directions. The arrows represent the transfer of energy and always point from the organism being eaten to the one that is doing the eating. What is a food web? A food web shows the flow of energy through a system, such as an estuary, and it begins with the sun. Most life uses the energy that comes from the sun. Autotrophs, or primary producers, use about 1% of the sun's energy that reaches the Earth's surface. Producers photosynthesize to create their own food, and that starts a food chain. Producers in the Puget Sound are phytoplankton, sea lettuce, bull kelp, eelgrass, and other algae. What is phytoplankton? Phytoplankton are microscopic plants that are primary producers and the most abundant producers in the marine environment. Phytoplankton are eaten by primary consumers. What is a consumer or heterotrophic? It's an organism that cannot make its own food, so it must consume other plant or animals. Primary consumers are also known as herbivores. In the estuary, they are barnacles, blue mussels, oysters, sea urchins, periwinkle snails, crustacean larvae, and many, many more. Primary consumers are eaten by secondary consumers, or carnivores, such as moon jelly, moon snails, sand lamps, and Pacific herring. These animals are then eaten by a higher level carnivore, like great blue herons, harbor seals, salmon, and sharks, which eventually leads to our apex predator, the orca. Organisms and food webs are commonly divided into trophic levels. These levels can be illustrated in a trophic pyramid, which organisms are grouped by the role they play in the food web. For example, the first level forms the base of the pyramid and is made up of producers. The second level is made up of herbivore consumers and so on. On average, only 10% of the energy from an organism is transferred to its consumer. As energy passes through the food web, each trophic level, or feeding level, captures only about 10% of the energy of the previous level. Because so little energy is kept at each level, and because higher level organisms tend to be larger than lower level organisms, there are very few top level carnivores. It takes 50,000 tons of phytoplankton to grow one 5 ton orca. Biomass that isn't eaten by consumers is processed by decomposers, such as bacteria, and detritivores, including some invertebrates and fish. Detritivores capture and recycle nutrients that otherwise might be lost to the ecosystem and make them available to organisms at higher levels of the food web. In the Puget Sound, detritivores are one of the most important groups supporting higher trophic levels. Food webs throughout the world all have the same basic trophic levels. However, the number and types of species that make up each level varies greatly between different areas and different ecosystems. What would happen if we removed one piece of the food web? In general, food webs with low biodiversity are more vulnerable to changes than food webs with high biodiversity. In some food webs, the removal of a plant species can negatively affect the entire food web, but the loss of one plant species that makes up only part of the diet of an herbivore consumer may have little or no effect. Some species in a food web are described as keystone species. A keystone species is one that has a greater impact on the food web than you would expect in relation to their abundance. The removal of a keystone species characteristically results in a major change. In the same way that removing a keystone from an arch or a bridge would cause the structure to collapse. In the Puget Sound, sea otters are a keystone species that controls the number of species it feeds on, for example, sea urchins. If the sea otter is removed, this can cause a large increase in the numbers of sea urchins, and this has a ripple effect throughout the food web, 
known as a trophic cascade. Many scientists investigate food webs in order to better understand how they may be affected by human impacts such as fishing, pollution, and tourism. Now we're going to do a little activity to see how well you know your food webs of the Puget Sound. We are going to draw our own food web with arrows representing the flow of energy as it moves through the food web. On our student worksheet, we need to start off our food web. What starts almost all food webs? The sun. Add a sun to your food web diagram. What converts the energy from the sun to produce its own food? Producers, like our plants, such as sea lettuce, bull kelp, or phytoplankton. Add aquatic plants to your food web. Now, what eats plants? Herbivores are primary consumers. You could add animals such as mussels, clams, oysters, or even barnacles. Now that we're moving up the trophic food levels, what comes after herbivores? Carnivores, or secondary consumers. You could add animals such as jellyfish, sea anemones, sea cucumbers, sea slugs, sea stars, or even smaller fish, eels, and skates. Draw arrows from the herbivores to the carnivores that eat them. What comes after are secondary consumers. Tertiary consumers are third level consumers. These animals are a little bit larger than our secondary consumers. They comprise of great blue herons, seagulls, harbor seals, sharks, and even octopus. Add a few third level consumers. Draw arrows from the secondary consumers to the animals in the third level that are eating them. Now that we're at the top of the food chain, we need to add our apex predator. What is one apex predator found in the Puget Sound? Orcas or killer whales. Add your apex predator to the top of your food chain. Make sure you have arrows connecting all food sources to their predators. Great, you've just created a food web of the Puget Sound, starting from the sun to primary producers to primary consumers, all the way up the trophic levels to an apex predator. Estuaries are ideal habitats for thousands of different plants and animal species. They contain an abundance of food sources, including nutrients and sediment and the water column. Over 75% of all fish and shellfish harvested for food in the U.S uses estuaries for breeding and nurseries. Next time you're at your local beach or estuary, look around and see how many food chains you can find. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Exploring with the Estuarium. If you liked our video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you wish to continue to get more of our educational videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook at the Puget Sound Estuarium. Bye.